Lesson 3.2, Extrema and Concavity. Now, of course, Lesson 3.1 was also titled Extrema and Concavity, but that was a graphical approach to Extrema and Concavity. In this lesson, we're going to take an algebraic approach to exploring Extrema and Concavity. And we're actually going to break this into two parts, where part one, we're going to focus on Extrema. Part two, we're going to focus on Concavity. As you'll recall, we have something called the first derivative test, which is for finding local or relative extrema. As always, we're going to find the derivative and the critical points by taking the derivative, setting it equal to zero or undefined. We're going to do some sort of sign analysis, whether it be a sign chart or just inspection of the graph. And then we're going to make a conclusion based on that sign analysis that the critical number either is or is not an extreme value, specifically a max or a min, a max change uh, for max the derivative changes from positive to negative for a min the derivative would change from negative to positive always remember that the sign analysis or sign chart on its own is never a conclusion unto itself you must state the actual conclusion with the justification being related to the behavior of the derivative so Let's jump into things. Let's start with this one. Hopefully you remember how to do this. It may have been a long summer, but this is one of those foundational skills. So go ahead and jump into it. Pause here, hit play when you're ready. All right, so we are finding all x values for which the given function attains a relative max or a relative min and justify your answer. Remember the justification has to do with that relationship of the derivative uh, being positive versus negative in the direction of change, which indicates max or min. So I'm looking for maxes and mins. I'm going to set my derivative equal to zero, but also keep in mind that undefined is an option for my derivative as well, especially in this situation where we have a rational function with an opportunity for a value that's undefined. And while we're on it, let's go ahead and address the fact that this is a rational function, which means we have a domain restriction. This rational function, the denominator can never equal zero, we have a domain restriction at zero, which means that this function either has a whole or a vertical asymptote at x equals zero. At both of those situations, any point where a function is, does not exist, if the function is uh, uh, has a discontinuity, then that means the derivative would not exist. So we know we have a situation where the function is gonna be not differentiable at x equals zero, just by initial analysis of the original function. Always pay attention to domain restrictions. There was a question very similar to this one that showed up on the AP exam a few years ago, where because students failed to pay attention to the domain restriction, they got the problem wrong. So let's start by taking our derivative. I'm gonna do a quotient rule, low d high minus high d low all over low squared. Let's clean this up a little bit before we go any further. This is gonna be four X to the fifth minus, that's gonna be two X to the fifth. And then we're gonna distribute the negative and that'll be two X all over X to the fourth. Let's keep going. That's two X to the fifth minus two X over X to the fourth. And I'm gonna go one more step because I have a common factor of x between the numerator and the denominator, I'm gonna change this to two x to the fourth minus two all over x to the third. So there's my derivative. And I'm gonna set this derivative equal to zero. And again, it can also be undefined. Equaling zero means set the top equal to zero. Undefined means set the bottom equal to zero. Well, the bottom is gonna equal zero when x is zero, which we already knew was gonna be an issue because of the domain restriction, but it also counts as a critical number. And the top equaling zero, we're gonna have two x to the fourth minus two. We can either do that real quick in our head and positive negative one. If you're unsure how I got that, we can solve it off to the side. I know that if I divide everything by two, I get this. X to the fourth equals one. Now, if I take the fourth root of both sides, I'm gonna get positive and negative one. Or you can recognize, well, if this is a fourth power, that means I should have four solutions, not two. I can get there another way by taking a square root followed by a square root. If I take that first square root, I get X squared. 
and positive negative 1 on the other side. And then if I take that second square root, on the left I get x. On the right, I'm taking the square root of positive 1, which is 1 and negative 1. I'm taking the square root of negative 1, which is i and negative i. And then I'm remembering that in calculus, I don't worry about imaginary solutions. We are only operating on real numbers. The question was about relative maxes and relative mins. Those are related to the graph of the function. The graph of the function does not contain imaginary plotting points. So we, you know, anytime you get an imaginary solution in calculus, you can basically just ignore it. Positive negative one are my only critical numbers, along with zero, of course. So I've got my critical numbers, relative max, relative mins have to occur at one of these three values. Let's go ahead and create a sign chart. Negative one, zero, and positive one. Now, the way I do a sign chart may be different than the way you've seen it in the past. There are different ways of doing sign charts. Uh, the way I'm going to approach the sign chart is I'm going to recognize instead of plugging in, so I have one, two, three, four different regions, I could pick a number from each of those four regions and plug it into my derivative and then just see if it comes out positive or negative. But because the derivative is a little bit more complex than I would like it, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break my sine graph into two sine graphs. And I'm going to do the top 2x to the fourth minus 2 as one sine graph. I'm going to do x cubed as a second sine graph. So for x cubed, I'm going to start with recognizing that the zero of x cubed is zero. And anything to the left of x equals zero versus anything to the right of x equals zero, they're going to be the same sign value all the way across. Between negative infinity and zero, it's all going to be the same sign value. Between zero and infinity, it's all going to be the same sign value for x cubed. Well, because it's x cubed, if I plug in a negative value, it's going to be a negative output. If I plug in a positive value to x cubed, it's going to be a positive output. So I can just use the fact that the function x cubed crosses the x axis at zero. It's negative to the left. It's positive to the right to very quickly fill in that sign chart. For 2x to the fourth minus 2, recall that negative 1 and positive 1 were the roots or the zeros of that function. Uh, based on my knowledge of polynomial functions, this is a quartic function. It has a positive uh, leading coefficient. So I know this quartic function is going to be even and it's opening up. So I know my quartic function is going to look something like that. So that means it's going to be positive on the ends and it's going to be negative between negative one and positive one. Now, because I did the sign chart as two separate charts, what I can now do is take the 2x to the fourth minus two chart, which was the numerator of my derivative, and the x cubed chart, which was the denominator of my derivative, and recognize that it's just the top divided by the bottom, the top divided by the bottom. Positive divided by a negative is always a negative. Negative divided by a negative is always a positive. Negative and a positive is a negative. Positive and a positive is a positive. So there is my completed sign chart, but we're not complete until we actually make a conclusion. So the question was to identify relative max and relative min at negative one. We're changing from down to up, so that one's going to be a min, so I have a relative min at x equals negative 1, because g prime, let's not forget that this function was called g, not f, g prime changes from negative to positive. All right. Now, at x equals 0, we go from positive to negative, up until to down. So you might say, oh, we have a relative max at x equals 0. But wait a second, no, we don't. Because x equals 0 is a domain restriction. There is either an asymptote or a hole at x equals 0. I could look further and recognize that it's an asymptote and not a hole, but it really doesn't matter. Because either way, that, that value doesn't exist on my graph, so it is neither a max nor a min. Now, this question didn't ask me to identify anything about that value, but if I, if it did, like I could say that uh, x equals zero is neither a max nor a min, uh, because x equals zero is a domain restriction.
restriction. The question didn't technically ask me about this, but this would be the answer if it did. So uh, the way the question could be phrased could be uh, identify all of the critical values of this function, identify whether each critical value is a max, a min, or neither. So that's another way of phrasing the question. Pay attention to the question and how it's phrased to make sure that you're answering the question. Find all x values for which the function obtains a relative max or relative min means I don't actually need to identify x equals zero at all. And then at ne or at positive one, we go from down to up. So that one is also a minimum. So I'm just going to amend my original statement to include negative one and positive one. Finally, here are two more for you to try. Go ahead and pause here. Hit play when you're ready. Now, as we are going through uh, these questions on this lesson, the intention of every question in this uh, lesson is that they be done by hand. You are also, as you know, uh, standing rule in this course uh, if we do a problem by hand feel free to check your answer after you've done it by hand uh, feel free to check your hands answer with a calculator uh, just to make sure that you you know are continuing to practice those calculator skills i tend not to uh, spend a lot of time on those calculator skills because i assume that you've mastered them at this point uh, so a lot of times it's going to be up to you just to make sure that you're maintaining those skills all right here we have a pretty straightforward polynomial. So let's do just like we did before. Take the derivative. Set it equal to zero. It's polynomial, so there's no opportunity for it to be undefined. I won't worry about it. I notice that there's a GCF of six, so I'm going to divide everything by six to make things easier for myself. I recognize that is easily factorable. Uh, factors of negative 6 that add to negative 1 would be negative 3 and positive 2. So then we have critical numbers. At x equals 3 and negative 2. We'll do a sign chart. And similar to what I did last time, instead of me breaking this or instead of me plugging in three separate values for each region, I'm going to break this into a sign chart for x minus 3 and a sign chart for x plus 2. Each one of these is linear. So x minus 3 is linear. It crosses the x-axis at 3. It's positive to the right. It's negative to the left. x plus 2 crosses at negative 2. It's positive to the right. It's negative to the left. Putting that together, I get positive, negative, Positive, no plug and chug necessary. So I'm looking for maxes and mins. I see that we're going up and then now, relative max at x equals negative two because this function was named f, f prime changes from positive to negative. And then we're going down and then up, relative min at x equals three because f prime changes from negative to positive, final answer. Looking at this one right here, I am going to take my derivative. Keep in mind, anytime I have radicals, Rewrite that as an exponent. Uh, it's not useful in this format. This is the more useful format in calculus. So one third, x plus one to the negative two thirds. Negative exponents are mean and ugly to work with. So I'm gonna rewrite this with a positive exponent. Uh, as soon as I recognize I have a variable on the bottom it means I have an opportunity for undefined. Numerator is one, so the function never equals zero. It only ever equals undefined, and it's only going to be undefined when x plus one is zero. So I have a critical number and x equals negative one. So let's do our sign chart. Only one critical number on this. 
chart. Uh, and this time I'm not going to break this up because the top is just one. So there's really no need uh, to do that one separately. On the bottom, I have x plus one. Now keep in mind it's to the two thermals, but it really says x plus one squared. And then that is being Q rooted. So no matter what value I plug in for X, I'm going to be squaring it. So that's always going to be positive. So no matter what, this is going to be positive. So since I have no sign change, I have no extreme. Now, this also leads me back to my point that I started with on question A. Pay attention to what type of function that you have here. Pay attention to, is there any domain restrictions? What's the behavior of this graph that we already know? Because when I looked at this one, I really didn't need to do any work at all because I recognized, oh, that's a cubic graph. It looks like this. A cube, or I'm sorry, a cube root graph always looks like this. Well, I know that it's not going to have any extrema because cube root graphs don't have any relative extrema. Uh, it does have a vertical tangent at the uh, uh, vertex of the cube root, which is why we had that critical number at negative one. It represented a vertical tangent. It did not represent extreme value. But if I know what the function looks like, I can answer these questions real quick. All right, let's change up the wording a little bit. Go ahead and pause here. Hit play when you're ready. Notice the change in phrasing. What is the maximum value? All right, I'm still looking for a maximum, but now I'm looking for the value, which means I'm looking for a y value. It also doesn't use the word relative. I'm on a closed interval, so we can assume that it's the absolute maximum y value. And as soon as I'm looking for an absolute maximum, I'm thinking candidates tests, which means we need the critical numbers as well as the endpoints. We're going to find our critical numbers, we're going to find our endpoints, and then we're just going to test each value in the function. Whichever one is the largest is the winner. So let's start the same way we always do for extreme. We take the derivative, set it equal to zero in undefined. This is a polynomial. There's no opportunity for undefined. I'm going to factor out a 4x. That's going to leave me with critical numbers. 0, 1, negative 1. So let's take those along with our endpoints and go ahead and test each value. Uh, the lowest number was negative 2. Doesn't matter what order you do these in, but I always like to do them in order. One being both an endpoint and a critical number. So I'm going to evaluate at each of those values, the function is x to the fourth minus 2x squared. I'm just going to rewrite that so I don't have to keep scrolling. x to the fourth minus 2x squared, x to the fourth minus 2x squared. Uh, easy one is plug in 0, I get 0. Plug in 1, that's going to be 1 minus 2, which is negative 1. Plug in negative 1, if you recognize that this is an even function because both uh, exponents are even, then we know we're going to get the same output, whether we plug in positive one or negative one, plug in negative two, that's going to be, well, it's going to be end up being positive to the same thing. Two to the fourth, that's 16, minus two squared is four times two is eight, so that's going to be eight. The question was, what is the maximum value? Respond to that question. The max value is, is the stem to the question that I'm looking for, and the maximum value is 8. Final answer. Answer the question that is being asked. Here are two more. Pause here. Play when you're ready. All right. Determine the absolute extreme values of the function on the given interval. So g prime equal 3x squared minus 12. So if that equal to 0, undefined is unnecessary because it's a polynomial. This is the same thing as x squared minus 4. So x equals positive negative 2 are my critical numbers. We'll test each one. 
including the endpoints. Uh, so notice that the interval goes from zero to five, so I can actually ignore negative two as a possibility. So I'm gonna test zero, two, and five. So at zero, we get zero. At two, I'm gonna get eight minus 24, which is gonna be negative 16. At five, that's gonna be 125 minus five times 12, that is 60. So that's gonna be 65. So now the question is determine the absolute extreme values of the function, extreme values of the function. So the absolute max is 65. The absolute min is negative 16. Also keep in mind on these types of questions, it doesn't ask us to justify, but if it did ask us to justify absolute extrema, the justification is this work right here. I don't need a sign chart one in justifying absolute extrema. The candidate's test of me actually testing the values is sufficient justification. Here's another one. Pause here. Play when you're ready if you haven't already. So let's start with the derivative. First, the second plus second, the first. Let's clean that up a little bit. That's going to be negative x squared e to the negative x plus 2x e to the negative x. Set that equal to 0 and undefined because of the negative exponent. I definitely have an opportunity uh, for undefined. I'm going to recognize that I could factor out an x e to the negative x. I'm going to go ahead and factor out a negative as well because anytime I have a leading negative, I like to pull that out. So that's going to leave me a positive x minus 2 when I factor that out. So I know I'm going to have a critical number of 2 right here. I also can see that 0 is going to be a critical number. And then e to the negative x, uh, it's never going to equal 0, but it's possible that it could be undefined. Keep in mind, e to the negative x, let's start with equaling 0. That's 1 over e to the x equals 0. So if I multiply both sides by e to the x, I get 1 equals 0, which is not true. So I know that's never true. And then undefined would be 1 over 0. 1 over 0. So here we have e to the x equals 0. So x equals ln of 0, which again is never going to be true. You can't have ln of 0. Again, if you know your graphs as well, we know that the graph of e to the x never equals 0. So we can just ignore that as a possibility. So my only critical numbers are 0 and 2 on this interval, negative 1 to 4. And the name, we don't have a name of the function. I'm just going to label this as f of negative 1, f of 0, f of 2, f of 4. The function was x squared e to the negative x. Let's write that down over here. x squared, I'm going to write it as x squared over e to the x to help me with my simplification of fractions. So if I start with 0, plugging in 0, I get 0. Uh, plugging in 2, that's going to be 4 over e squared. Plugging in 4, I get 16 over e to the 4th. And then plugging in negative 1, I get 1 over e to the negative 1, which is, of course, just e. Question is about absolute extreme values. So I need the maximum and the minimum. First thing I notice is that all of these numbers were positive. So my minimum must be zero. All right. Now for the maximum, it helps to have some basic understanding of what the number E is. It's approximately 2.718. Uh, so I'm just gonna Think of it as 
if I take that number and I square it, 2.7 squared is definitely going to be bigger than 4. So, because 2 squared is 4, so 2.7 is bigger than 4. So 4 over e squared is going to be less than 1. And if this is less than 1, then it's definitely less than e. Over here, I have 2.7 to the 4th. By the exact same argument, 2 to the 4th is 16. 2.7 to the 4th is larger than 16. This is less than 1. Therefore, my absolute maximum is e. Final answer. Let's keep it going. Try this one. Pause here. Play when you're ready. Notice we're once again looking for the absolute extrema, but we're not given endpoints this time. So what's different here is that we're still looking for absolute extrema, but on an open interval instead of a closed interval. So let's start the same process. Set this equal to zero. Undefined is not necessary. Uh, so I'm going to factor out 12x squared. That's going to leave me with x minus 2 critical numbers. All right, x equals 0 and 2. Now, there are no endpoints, so the candidates test is not going to work because just because one of these is a uh, large value or a small value does not mean that it's the largest value overall or the smallest value overall. Because this is on an open interval, there's the possibility that the end behavior to the right side or to the left side goes up or down forever. The way we're going to test this is by using Accenture. Do my little two-part sign chart again. I know 12x squared is always positive. No matter what number I plug in for x, that's going to be a positive value. For x minus 2, it changes sign at 2. It's positive to the right, negative to the left. So we have negative, negative, positive. So what I've now established is that x equals 0 is nothing. And x equals 2 going from down to up is a min. Now, it doesn't tell me that it's an absolute min. It just tells me that it's a relative min. Again, open interval means the graph goes forever. So if the graph, the derivative is positive for x greater than 2, that means the graph is going to go up and to the right forever. This function goes up to infinity. Since this function goes up to infinity, that means there is no absolute max. Since there is no absolute max, uh, there can still be an absolute min. I don't have evidence yet that this is an absolute min, but I do have evidence that there is no absolute max. If I look at the other side of the graph, the function is decreasing, which means as we go to the left forever, the graph is actually going up again. So the graph goes up forever in both sides, that means it never goes down forever. So anywhere there's a relative min, that must also be an absolute min. Absolute min at x equals 2. Going back to my pre-calculus, this is a quartic function. It's an even quartic function, meaning the right and left side have to agree. The leading coefficient is positive. So before I even started, I knew this graph was going to look like this. I could immediately say there is no absolute maximum, but there must be an absolute minimum at one of these two values, and I found it at x equals 2. Also notice, absolute minimum at x equals 2, double check that we've answered the question, determine where the absolute minimum occurs. The question was not what is the absolute minimum, but where does it occur? Go ahead and try it again. Pause here. Play when you're ready. Obviously, I'm going to do the easy one and leave you the fun one. So let's take a derivative. Low d high minus high d low all over low squared. Set this equal to zero. 
or undefined. On the top, I have x squared plus 1 minus 2x squared. On the bottom, I have x squared plus 1 squared. So on the top, I have negative x squared plus 1 over x squared plus 1 squared. Again, 0 or undefined. At the bottom, I see x squared plus 1. That has no solutions over the real number system. So the bottom never equals 0. On the top, though, because of that negative, I do have the opportunity to equal 0. So that one's going to be plus or minus 1 strictly from the numerator. Critical numbers. And while I'm thinking about that denominator never equaling 0, if I go back up here, x squared plus 1 never equals 0. I have no domain restrictions. Keep that in mind. Sign chart. When I set up my sign chart, the bottom x squared plus 1 squared is always positive. If it's always positive, then it's going to have no effect on my chart whatsoever. So I'm just going to worry about negative x squared plus 1. I know negative x squared plus 1 changes sign at negative 1 and positive 1. Since the leading coefficient is negative, it's going to be negative on the outside, positive on the inside. The question was to identify the absolute maximum. I know that we have a relative maximum right here. I know the graph is going to be decreasing to the right. I know that the graph is decreasing over here as well. That means as we go to the left, it's pointing up. If the graph is decreasing, it's going down and to the right, which means to the left, it's going up. So we have a graph that goes up and to the left, has a minimum, has a maximum, and then does something like this. So I might say to myself, OK, so since the graph right here goes up, that means we're going up to infinity down to negative infinity, this graph has no absolute extrema whatsoever. And that is the incorrect answer. Because again, we need to pay attention to what kind of function we have here. Yes, there's uh, uh, there are no domain restrictions, but this is still a rational function, which is a bottom-heavy rational function. And because it's bottom-heavy, we have a, a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0, which means the end behavior was not unknown like it was with the polynomial graph. In this one, the end behavior, it's going to level off to y equals 0. This graph does not go down forever. It goes down and then levels off at y equals 0. Same thing over here. It's going to level off at y equals 0. So if I were to sketch this, I know that I have uh, critical values at negative 1 and positive 1. Uh, positive 1 is going to be a max. Negative 1 is going to be a minimum. And I have a horizontal asymptote. So I know at positive 1, there's going to be a max somewhere. At negative 1, there's going to be a minimum somewhere. I also know that this function equals 0 at 0. So I'm going to have a graph that looks something like this, which means that this maximum right here actually is an absolute max. When we're looking for extrema, we need to tie in all that pre-calculus knowledge that we know about graph behavior in order to make a conclusion. So we have an absolute max at x equals 1. You're welcome.